Our reading this morning is taken from the epistle of James, and this week we read from chapter 3, verse 13, through to chapter 4, verse 12. James chapter 3, 13, through to chapter 4, verse 12. And please let me encourage you to take up one of the pew Bibles, if there's one nearby, and follow the reading with us. And then either leave it open for the sermon or pop a marker in there. James chapter 3 at verse 13. James is very near the end of the New Testament, very near the end of the Bible. James writes, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us tends towards envy, but he gives us more grace? That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you who are double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Amen, and may God bless us. God bless this reading to us and help us to understand it. Later. To James chapter 3 then, and these verses that we read earlier on. What James wrote in the verse before the verses that we read is in a sense a springboard for what he wrote that we did read. My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, James there is talking about the things we say. But he is pointing to one of the fundamental principles of Christian living. It's one that Jesus pointed people to time and time again. That what we say or what we do reveals what we are within. We are unconsciously telling people about ourselves. Every time we open our mouths, every action we make, everything that we do not do, 
What we say, what we do, reveals what we are within. A salt spring cannot produce fresh water. One that is rotten inside cannot produce pure sweet water. Conversely, a heart, in the context of last week's passage about what we say, a heart that is full of praise, not not merely a mouth that is full of praise, but a heart that is full of praise, will not produce curses. And it's that that has really opened up for James once more in his epistle. The real problem that faces the Christians that he was writing to If we may use again the sort of pithy phrase, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. See, James knows fine well that it is possible for a person to be a Christian. However we want to express that, whether we say that a person is justified by grace through faith, whether a person has been converted, Whether a person has been saved, whether a person has been born again, whether a person has asked Christ into their lives, it's possible to be a Christian, to have a new relationship with God, to be given a new nature, to have a new destiny, and yet for there still to be so much work that needs doing in the heart. So much in that person's life that needs transforming. So far still to go. Unless the mainspring of our behavior is transformed. Unless what drives our speech, our attitudes, our action, our inaction is transformed. Then we will be, even as Christians, those who find it constantly difficult to live true to what God has done. And so here James goes in for what we might call in a sense some spiritual open heart surgery. The passage that we've read is not a comforting passage. It is not a nice sweet passage. James has a very sharp scalpel And he goes in for that most delicate and yet important of all spiritual surgery. He goes to the very heart of the believer. Well, what's your spiritual heart like this morning? James gives us in these verses that we read a couple of checklists, if you like. He has woven throughout what he writes a whole list of negative heart conditions, of things that can be wrong with the spiritual heart. And he has a positive list as well. The negative are those things which are causing the quarrels, the strife, the boasting, the need, the divisions, all manner of sins, slander, other things. The positive can cause so much more good. So I want us to go through some of the things that James is talking about, that he's woven through here, some of the things which apply to the heart of the believer. You may suffer from some of these complaints on the negative list. We all do. I speak as much to myself as I do to anyone else. Here goes. On the negative side, there is envy and selfishness. Ouch. Envy and selfishness. We want what somebody else has got. And part of our wanting it is simply because they have got it and we haven't. If you know the kind of attitude, there's only one thing wrong with that BMW, it's somebody else's. But it's not just envy and selfishness that James is talking about. He talks about harboring envy 
and selfishness. He talks about providing a safe haven where envy and selfishness will not be sunk by God's storms, where envy and selfishness can take up residence, can find a safe place, where envy and selfishness go unmolested and in fact protected. Martin Luther said, you can't stop birds flying around your head, but you can stop them nesting in your hair. James is writing to those Christians who have let envy and selfishness nest, harbor. Next thing on the list, a heart with, if you like, a devilish pacemaker. In the previous passage, James was talking about how destructive we can be with what we say, and he was saying that our tongue sometimes is like something that is set on fire by hell. There's a devil who's behind it. There's a devil who sparks things off between people. There is a devil who can affect our hearts and has done. Such wisdom, he writes, does not come down from heaven but is earthly and spiritual of the devil. Greed and covetousness. Wanting for myself and wanting more. That insatiable appetite. We tell ourselves that only if only we have this or that or the other we will be happy. And yet getting this, that or the other only whets our appetite for more. Greed and covetousness. Is there none of that in my heart? A self-serving godlessness. And James says, uh, you have not or you do not have because you do not ask God. He isn't there saying, go and ask God for whatever you want and he'll give you it. What he's saying is you want so many things but you never bother turning to God. You never bring your prayers to God. You just find ways of getting what you want for yourself. And even when you do turn to God, your prayers are self-serving. Because what you want is just something for yourself. Just something for yourself. A self-serving godlessness. I'll give you a kind of trivial example. Walking through the crowded uh, Murray Gate the other day, it, uh, it came into my mind just what marvelous presents uh, we could buy for our two girls if we had just another hundred pounds which is the kind of price of Christmas presents these days. And, uh, and the next thought behind that was, I wonder what I could get for myself if I had a thousand. There is something about us which imagines what we could get for ourselves. Our imaginations can become suddenly incredibly fertile when we start thinking of the things that we would quite like or the things we could do if we had more money. Worldliness of heart. James calls it spiritual adultery. When he says in verse 4, you adulterous people, he's not talking about marital infidelity. He's talking about spiritual infidelity. He's talking about hearts that should be beating with love for God, instead beating with love for the world and all its goodies and all its values. Unrepentance and pride. A kind of hardness of heart. A kind of automatic resistance to the very thing that James is saying. Don't you dare point up this or that or the other in my life, James. Don't you dare say that I, of all people, have to say sorry to God. Last on the list, a judgmental attitude with its slanderous speech. Brothers, do not slander one another. 
Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law. Why not judge one another? Because there is only one judge. And that is God. And God has sent his son to die for your brother or sister in Christ. And none of those things within us. It is a painful list to read. If we take this passage this morning at all seriously, it has its moments of pain. But it is God's work to change us within. Remember, James is addressing the heart. He is going to the very core of people's lives. God's work changes within so that we might live differently. We get frustrated with ourselves, annoyed at ourselves, disappointed at ourselves. Those around us do the same. And we wish we were different. We wish we could change. We wish we could be better. It's God's work to make us better. But he starts that work at the very core. There are symptoms on this list of spiritual heart complaints which we may suffer from. God sees it and he knows it. And though God's word becomes for a while a scalpel, and his hands become for a while surgeons' hands, yet he would have us with strong hearts. He would have us in biblical terms holy in our hearts. And so James is not scared to write. His love for these Christians would fail if he didn't. But he has his positive list too. There are other things. Things which he urges upon these Christians and things which to some extent he recognizes in their lives already. For are we not all mixtures? There are the positive attributes. The first is wisdom. Knowing how to live aright before God. Wisdom. And that, in a sense, gives rise to a whole lot of other things. It gives rise to humility. And we might expect that. If we know how to live aright before God, then the first attitude we must have before him is one of humility. He is God. He is Lord. He is Sovereign. He is holy and pure and right. And we ain't. Humility. Lowliness. Humility which itself gives rise to good deeds. Humility which receives grace because the heart is open. Humility which makes people pure. Not necessarily morally pure there, but having, if you like, untainted motives. Pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive. Um, James there isn't telling everybody to be doormats, to be walked all over. He's talking about what elsewhere is translated meekness. Meekness. Not being uppity. Not pushing to the front of every queue. Not elbowing everyone else out of the way to make sure you get your way. Another pithy phrase, somebody once said, if you think it's weak to be meek, try being meek for a week. It's not weakness, not a doormat, but the strength that can allow others to have their way. Full of mercy and good fruit, good deeds. Impartial, that is fair and truth-loving. Oh, we are quick to take sides. Once we have taken sides, then it is extremely difficult for anybody to get us to shift. We make what we might call interpretive lines with people. Once somebody has done something wrong, then we tend to interpret everything else they do or say in light of that. We lose our impartiality. We lose our love of the truth. We lose our clarity of vision. The wisdom 
that is humble before God makes people impartial, fair, truth-loving, and sincere. Sincere is a very helpful word. It comes from a Greek word which was commonplace in the markets in the Greek world. If you were selling a pot and that pot had been cracked or had a hole in it, then it was kind of practiced to fill in the crack with wax and cover it all over. But all you needed to do was hold the pot up to the light and the light would shine a bit through the wax but not through the clay. And you could tell whether that pot had been cracked and filled in, whether that was, literally from the Greek, a sincere pot. Now James would have his Christian readers be sincere. Not covering over the cracks, not pretending to be something that they're not, but being real. And two of these qualities are singled out. It is the humility and the submission. Which brings us, if you like, to the very core of our question this morning. Is my heart hardened, stony, proud against the word of God? Against what God says and what God's demand, what God demands? Or is my heart a heart of flesh that beats with love for God, that willingly submits in due and proper humility to the one who is Lord and God and Savior and the lover of our souls. The heart that is right before God, the heart that has that humility and submissiveness is a heart, and we may read this from the verses in chapter 4 from verse 7 onwards a heart that resists the tempter because it wants nothing to do with sin a heart that draws near to God in prayer what a promise draw near to God and he will draw near to you a heart that has a willingness to repent a willingness to say sorry a willingness to be changed by God It's all summed up in the refrain, if you like, of that hymn that we sang before the sermon. Thy will be done. That's what Jesus said in Gethsemane. Faced with the awesome black chasm of a hill called Calvary. He said, thy will be done. He knew what it would mean. But he said it all the same. That's the way our Savior leads us. That's the spirit that he would reproduce within us. C.S. Lewis wrote at one point this phrase. He said there are in the end only two sorts of people. Those who say to God thy will be done and those to whom God says in the end thy will be done let us learn to say to him now whether for the first time or for the umpteenth thy will be done in my heart in my life in my home, at my work, with my friends, in my church, when I'm on my own, when I'm in a crowd, thy will be done. Amen.